Hey, what's going on? Welcome back to Dapper Dividends. I'm Russ. If you're an AT&T shareholder, you've already gotten something inside your email box, inside your inbox, telling you that it's time to vote, that you are entitled to vote. So we're going to look at the proxy vote. I went through all 94 pages of the proxy statement to pick out the things that I thought were most interesting, most important to a beginner, to somebody that's never looked at a proxy statement before. A lot of it is pretty boring and we're gonna try and get through some of the most important things and tell you exactly what's going on in that. So more than likely you did receive something that looks like this inside of your email inbox telling you that it's time for the annual meeting, which will be held April 30th, and you have to vote by April 29th, 2021. So what are we voting on? You are also able to attend the meeting online in addition to voting. The first thing that I came across inside of the proxy statement was from the CEO, John Stanky, where he said there's three areas they're going to focus on is leveraging the world-class fiber and wireless infrastructure to carry more broadband traffic and serve more customers across all segments than any other U.S. company. So this is his mission statement, uh, the three-pronged approach, developing a next-generation entertainment distribution platform built for subscription and advertising-based customer relationships. And third, creating and curating an industry-leading offer of premium entertainment content that profitably grows our customer relationships beyond our traditional connectivity-based services. So those are three areas that they are looking to grow. And of course, what catches my eye is that they want to invest in growth and reduce debt while creating long-term value and sustaining our dividend for you, the owners. So they are well aware that the dividend is one of the things that so many people like myself are holding AT&T for. Quick little rundown of the AT&T notice of the 2021 annual meeting of stockholders. It's exciting, it's incredible. Is that the purpose of the annual meeting is to consider and take action on the following election of directors, ratification of Ernst & Young as independent auditors, Advisory approval of executive compensation, that's probably going to be the most in-depth that we'll cover. And then any other business that may come before the meeting, including stockholder proposals. And you are able to vote and attend this if you are a holder of the stock at close of business on March 2nd, 2020. 21. You also are able to ask questions. If you're a stockholder of record, you will be able to submit questions in writing during the meeting through the meeting portal. As you can see there, follow your codes and your control numbers and you will be able to submit questions beginning three days before the day of the meeting by going to proxyvote.com. So check this out. As of March 2nd, 2021, there were 7.14 billion shares of AT&T common stock entitled to vote at the meeting. Uh, to constitute a quorum to conduct business at the meeting, stockholders that need to represent at least 40% of the shares of common stock entitled to vote at the meeting must be present and, or represented to be proxied. This is something that was pretty interesting. There's only two companies that are major holders of AT&T, which is BlackRock and the Vanguard Group, uh, with 6.8% and 7.81% respectively. I just thought that was interesting. There's currently 13 directors on the board, but check this out. Richard Fisher will retire at the 2021 annual meeting and will not stand for re-election. Accordingly, the board has voted to reduce its size to 12 directors effective immediately before the meeting. So they voted to knock the board down to only 12 spots, and those are the spots we will be voting on. As you see here, these are the 12 people that are up for election on the board, and the board recommends that you vote for them. So that always makes me kind of laugh. I, I can't imagine they would say you shouldn't vote for us. So those are the 12 people, and the note at the bottom, all director nominees are independent, which I will cover in a second, except for Mr. Stanky. This is very cool. They have uh, a little bit of an in-depth, and I only grabbed one page of it, a little table showing all of their skills and giving them bullet points for how unique they are and why they're qualified to be on the board. They have a little card. It's like a baseball card for each of the members of the board so you can familiarize yourself with them. Just everything you want to know about everyone on the board, it's all right there. 
Item number two is the ratification of the appointment of Ernst and Young LLP as independent auditors. This was a very short segment and you get to vote if you want uh, in Ernst and Young to be <laughs> the independent auditors or not. Number three, and this was the one I'm gonna spend the most amount of time on, is the advisory approval of executive compensation. So this is something that you should be aware of is where I highlighted that while this is a non-binding advisory vote, the committee intends to take into account the outcome of the vote when considering future executive compensation arrangements. So if you vote against this and it's unanimous, they will take that into consideration, but it's not binding but it will let them know that we, the shareholders, don't like how much they are paying the executives. This is fun that the Corporate Governance and Nominating Committee is responsible for identifying eligible candidates based on our Corporate Governance Guidelines. So there is a committee that puts people through a battery of guidelines to nominate them to be on the board. But you, the stockholder, you can suggest qualified candidates you have to write to the senior vice president and there is the address down there. So that note about Mr. Stanky being the only one that was not independent on the board, what does that mean? This explains it all for you is that for the director to be independent, they have to have no material relationship with AT&T, either directly or as a partner, stockholder, or officer of an organization that has a relationship with AT&T. According to the New York Stock Exchange, they have been deemed uh, independent. As you see right down in the middle there, it shows that they are indeed independent members of the board. Director compensation. The compensation of directors is determined by the board with the advice of the corporate governance and nominating committee. None of our employees serve on this committee. They want to point that out. So it's not AT&T voting themselves uh, largesse from the, from the company. These are supposed to be independent people that are making the nominations for the uh, director compensation. They have a nice little table here that does outline the principles that guide them toward what they pay, aligning with the stockholders, what we say, uh, competitive and market-based, that they look at what other CEOs are making and other uh, board of directors are being paid. They try and tie the pay for performance, try and tie it to the performance of the company, where in that bar they show that 89% of Mr. Stanky's uh, CEO target compensation uh, was at risk and tied to short and long-term performance. All that means is they're saying that 89% of his pay, of his uh, target compensation was not guaranteed and it was all uh, dependent on how the company did. Table here showing the compensation from 2020 that $140,000 every member of the board, every board director is going to be getting that as a base. And then there's uh, stock that is awarded to them and various other things. And then on the next chart, they do show how much they were compensated, exactly the total, so we all can see that. And then they show here the corporate consolidated accomplishments, of course, I noticed the dividend of 54.5% and I want to point that out because this is the free cash flow payout ratio, not earnings per share because the earnings per share number uh, is an accounting number that can be manipulated by accountants. The free cash flow cannot. People will go to jail if they try and manipulate that number. So the payout of the dividend is only 54% of the free cash flow, which is why I am so confident in AT&T to be able to maintain the dividend. And I believe they will eventually increase it before Q421. Again, with the pay governance, they show their practices, what they do and what they don't do. And what I really like is no excessive dilution. So they're not issuing more and more shares to bring in more money to try and pay down debt. And they're not burning through that cash. So... This is really good. I like to see that the total dilution is less than 1% of outstanding stock. Now they have 7 billion shares, so that's still a big number. But you know what? I do like that. And these are very interesting uh, things to look through. This shows their fixed pay and the at-risk pay, the base salary, and they explain it. And then what 
is at risk and what the incentives are for them to help the company perform better so they can receive better compensation. And they call it symbiotic because the employees get more money, the stockholders get more money, and everyone's a big happy AT&T family. And as we touched on, determining the 2020 target compensation is what they used. Uh, companies anywhere from Amazon, Apple, Oracle for the CEO, the CFOs, uh, they look at the other companies, the other co they all look at each other and try and keep somewhat in line with the other companies, what they are paying their executive officers. This is fun, the personal benefit chart. It shows everything from financial counseling that's provided to the automobile, the company automobile, to the personal use of the company aircraft. And if it is personal use, you can see that they do have to reimburse the company. So this is a fun little chart. And here they do break out exactly how much of the personal benefits cost the company for us shareholders to see. And the summary compensation table is there for us to look at exactly what the NEOs, the named executive officers, were compensated in 2020 and the few previous years before that. Uh, just a very useful chart to see exactly how egregious they may be getting or if they are actually being reduced in pay. Again, a lot of this is boring to some of you, but if you've never seen any of this before, then this is going to be just nice to know it's there if you ever wanted to look. Uh, the pension benefits they go through for the named executive officers. And then they list the severance payments, the change in control severance payments. They give a description there that if they leave or are terminated for uh, good reason, then this is what their severance package will be. A lot of people are concerned about this, the CEO pay ratio they have in the proxy statement. For AT&T, we can see that Mr. Stanky's total compensation was $20.3 million, and the median employee is making $89,000, which is a ratio of 227 to 1. So Mr. Stanky is making $227 to every $1 for the median employee. This was a fun chart that they showed how they determined the number of employees for the median employee selection. And check that out, Cuba, Iraq, El Salvador, and Lithuania all have one employee. That's pretty impressive. One employee in each of those countries representing AT&T, as opposed to 181,960 across the United States. And the fourth and last is the shareholder right to act by written consent. So this was fun. This was a letter from a shareholder and they want to take action by written consent in place of a meeting is a means shareholders can use to raise important matters outside the normal annual meeting cycle like the election of a new director. Shareholders are also severely restricted in making their views known at online shareholder meetings because all challenging questions and comments can be screened out at an online meeting. So the people that wrote this don't like the fact that, uh, as they give an instance here, I highlighted that Goodyear management hit the mute button right in the middle of a formal shareholder proposal presentation at its 2020 shareholder meeting. Uh, with a deep slumping stock price, Goodyear management simply did not want shareholders to hear constructive criticism. Uh, plus, AT&T management would not even allow the proponents of shareholder proposals to read their proposals by telephone at the 2020 AT&T online annual meeting. And they give a website that goes into detail about the investors being denied um, a dial. And so basically what they're saying is they want a written consent which would give them the ability, think of it like political elections. Say every four years we hold a presidential election. Well, if enough people wanted to write their consent to give uh, call another election or potentially replace the president. So it's something that the board is not going to want to be for. Uh, and they give their rebu rebuttal here where they say AT&T opposes this proposal because our bylaws permit a group of stockholders holding 15% of the outstanding shares to call for a special meeting of stockholders. At a special meeting, stockholders can review and debate the merits of the proposal submitted to the meeting. In contrast, a written consent permits stockholders to act without discussion or debate. They're worried about action without discussion or debate that they want to have control of. So there's good and there's a bad to both. 
personally, I think that it's best to do it at the shareholder meeting because everybody knows when it's coming. It's just the order of things. So personally, I would be voting with the board and going against this proposal. And to wrap this all up, there's a couple few things I was interested in. Uh, ESG is all the rage now, the environmental, social, and governance. This shows the gender and race ethnicity of the director nominees for AT&T, where you can see it is 25% female and 25% people of color. So still in the minority, but AT&T is making this fully disclosed and impacts with the environmental aspect. They are showing the emission reduction targets uh, that AT&T has set forth and some of the social. I thought this was interesting that they made an additional $10 million commitment to work with Connected Nation to provide our most vulnerable students Wi-Fi hotspots and free AT&T internet service. They give a little bit of a breakdown of their workforce diversity uh, this is part of the social. So this is just something that is, I covered in my Clorox video. The ESG is here to stay and it's the tidal wave and certain companies are trying to get out in front of the tidal wave instead of being crushed by it, which is a good thing. I think everybody wins with this. And wrap it all up with last but not least, they pointed out again that the dividend was only 54.5% of free cash flow which gives me the warm and fuzzy that they will not only be able to sustain the dividend, but they will be increasing it. Now they do have until quarter four of 21 to increase the dividend to remain a dividend aristocrat, having paid an increasing dividend for 25 consecutive years. I don't think they have any problem doing that. I think they're just using this time to bring in a little bit more money instead of the penny increase that they're likely going to have given. And they will be giving us an increase. It'll be a nice Christmas gift from AT&T. Follow me on Twitter at RustyRam78. You can check me out on Instagram at TapDividends. And please, if I've helped you at any point during this video, help me out with a like and a subscribe. Expertise truly does come from the community. I am far from perfect, so let me know if I've missed something or you have a suggestion or your comment to add no matter what it is. Please leave a comment in the comments below because you know where the comments go. We would love to talk to you and I will talk to you in the next video.